yeah, there you, you probably heard that. I just recorded it. So hopefully my computer can handle all that. Um, okay, so I'm I'm actually going to put this question on hold then just because I am pretty certain it's not relevant. So yeah, exponential change you can expect to see, to see just in regards to capacitors. Um, potentially a passing thing on uh, fluid flow, but I think I'm almost certain it's just capacitors and that's the way it's pretty much always been in the past few years. Um, where you, can you find practice for that? I think most, I mean, any capacitor problem is an exp exponential change problem. Um, so just, yeah, I'm sure we'll we'll run into them. Let's go for, and, and if you, um, yep. Sorry, would it be okay if we not talking about this question? Can I have another question, which is sure, yeah, related to the exponential curve, but it's somewhere related to capacitor? Sure, yeah. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, can we please talk about final three, question two? Final three, question. Okay, this one here. Yes, thank you. Yeah, definitely. So let me zoom this out a little bit. And let's see. Everyone see that? That looked good. Okay, I'm going to assume that's a yes. All right, we have consider the circuit to the right at time t equals zero. The plate labeled plus on the capacitor has a certain charge. So we're starting with charge already built up on the capacitor. Um, graph the potential difference across the capacitor as a function of time. Um, be careful of signs, label the time constant, including its value. OK, so um, we're not given a graph, right? We're just doing this on our own. So let's go ahead and draw our axes. So what we're plotting is delta VC. And um, so whether it's positive or negative for the, the potential difference across a capacitor, it depends on, on what direction around the circuit you're going, right? In this case, we see current is labeled as going clockwise here. So um, I guess if we were following this current, it would be going positive to negative. So we would have a potential decrease. Um, but let's just plot it as positive because we're just we'll we'll consider it the magnitude of the potential difference across the capacitor. So that way we're we're good no matter what. The plus or minus is specific to how we're we're using our loop rule, and then that's as a function of time. And so we're given our initial point, but not in terms of voltage. We are given that our initial charge is 0.12 coulombs. So we need to turn this charge along with the capacitance we're given, which is 0.1 farads, into a voltage, right? Um, someone that, if you raise your hand during this, it's going to be really hard for me to like answer questions as we go. So um, if you have some a question about what I'm saying, you can just butt in and, and go ahead and ask it. Does anyone have something now? OK, if not, I'll continue along. So what we're looking for, let's call this delta VC initial. This is our starting point. Or maybe even instead of initial, we can say delta VC at time 0, right? VC of 0. And sorry, I'm not very neat with this here. Um, so it's going to be a function of our capacitance, 0.1 farad, and our charge, um, 0.12. And so who can tell me? I'm trying to make this a little interactive. How what really, how am I going to set this up? So I have this value here, which we'll call Q. And I have this value here, my capacitance, which I'll call C. What's the relationship between voltage, charge, and capacitance? Anyone that wants to go ahead and tell us. Is it Q over C? It is Q over C. So we just divide our charge by our capacitance. And one little trick, and like, I mean, not really a trick, you have this on your equation sheet as well, but let's like conceptually just double check. We know that as more and more charge builds up on the capacitor, the voltage difference between the two plates builds up. 
right? The more charge, the higher voltage difference between the two. And this equation shows the larger Q is, the larger the voltage difference across. And conversely, the larger the capacitor, the capacitance is, the easier it is to build up charge. So the less difficult it is to build up, and so the lower the voltage um, you have if the capacitance is higher with the same given charge. OK, so anyway, Q over C. So we can plug that in for our initial values. That is 0.12 coulombs and 0.1 farads, which is like these units are nicely will already give us volts. Like we don't have any like, you know, I don't know, microfarads or, or something like that. And so we'll get this equals 1.2 volts. So our initial voltage we'll just call 1.2 volts. OK, and now we have something nice. So we've hooked this capacitor up to the battery. And we can see that the voltage on the capacitor at the given moment of like our initial time is lower than the voltage of the battery, right? So if we go around, like we still have to have the loop rule at any given moment, we get plus 1.5 volts from the battery. Then as we go across from plus to minus of the capacitor, we'll have minus 1.2 volts, and then the rest must be across the resistor. But what this tells us is that the capacitor is not done filling up, right? When we hook a capacitor up to a battery, it's going to charge up, or I guess it could lose charge depending on what its initial charge was, but it's going to charge up to the voltage of the battery. And since it's not yet there, we know the charge is going to keep building up. And the voltage across the capacitor is going to keep building up until it reaches 1.5 volts. So I'm going to label these two with horizontal dotted lines. Between these two, that's how much the voltage is going to grow. right? And it's we know it's going to asymptotically approach 1.5 volts. So with these exponentials, they're always going to really look one or two ways. A capacitor is either discharging, where we get something that asymptotically approaches 0, or it's charging up, where we get something that asymptotically approaches a positive value. So we know since it's charging up, we're going to have something that looks like this. And we can just right away go ahead and draw it. So I mean, it does. you don't have to be super exact with this. I'm particularly bad because I'm using this tablet that I'm not so good at using. But this is supposed to be an increasing exponential. It's still, it's not, so it's weird calling this exponential decay. And I think this is important. All of the exponentials we do are exponential decay because it's the slope that's decaying away, right? It starts steeper. And as we go, as time advances, the, sh the slope decays away to zero. Even though the value is increasing, which is weird. It's why we call it decay. The value is increasing, but the slope, the rate of change is decaying. OK, so this is what it's going to do. Last thing we need to do is label this time axis somehow, right? Um, so it wants us to label the time constant, including its value. So time constant, we have an expression for tau, which is what? Someone want to tell me it depends on, well, maybe I'll just, there's too many people in here for that. But we have a capacitor and we have a resistor, and it depends on both of those things. And it's just the multiple, the resistance times the capacitance. The larger the resistor, like the, the harder it is for current to flow, the longer the circuit will take to evolve. And same thing, the larger the capacitor is, the more space there is for charge to build up, the longer the circuit is going to take to evolve. So there's our, our tau, and we already have both of these values. We're given capacitance is 0.1, resistance is 10, ohms and farads, nice and easy. So 10 times 0.1, our time constant is just going to be one second. So I can go ahead and label that on here. But we need to be, I mean, not super exact because I'm drawing this all by hand, and as you would have been as well. But we do want to label um, on the graph where that's going to occur. So the time constant occurs when the, so, well, why don't we do this real quick? The exponentials work like V as a function of time. Let's just say voltage for here is equal to some V initial times E to the negative T over tau. And this is actually a decaying one. In th this case here, we would have um, the one minus E to the negative T over tau. But what I really just wanted 
Well, yeah, maybe we should do that actually. Sorry. Let me draw the actual equation we have. So an increasing exponential. Where'd my pen go? Um, sorry, my Zoom window is blocking. Oh, no, it wasn't. OK, anyway, here's that. We have v naught, our initial, times 1 plus e, or sorry, 1 minus. 1 minus, and this is getting really messy. My bad, I didn't think that through. 1 minus e to the negative t over tau, where v naught here um, is going to be 1.5 volts. That's the value we're approaching. Um, and yeah, because if you plug in t equals, or sorry, actually, that's not, this one's kind of weird because we're going between a non zero value and a larger value. So the, the equation is actually going to look a little different. We want something that when you plug in t equals zero, you get 1.2. And when you plug in t equals infinity, you get 1.5, which neither of our main equations will have that, something in between. But the thing I really wanted to get at is that when you have t equals tau, so when you end up with t equals negative t, or sorry, negative tau over tau, so when t equals tau, you get e to the negative 1, which is approximately 1 third. Right? It's pretty close to 1 third, 1 over 2.67 or something like that. Um, so it, once the time constant uh, has passed, like when one time constant has elapsed, we have decayed to one third of the original value. Another way to say that is you've gotten about two thirds of the way to where you're going. So it's very like simply in this, like if we're just being rough, like roughly approximating here, the system here is evolving from 1.2 to 1.5. So this delta is just 0.3 volts, right? That's how much it's growing. So after one time constant has elapsed, after one second has elapsed, it will have gone two thirds of the way there. So it will have roughly gone up to about 1.4. Let's say that's like right here. And that's after tau equals one second has elapsed. Um, so if it was decaying, it would be, you know, two thirds, it would still be two thirds of the way there. So let's say in this case, it was decaying. This isn't what, hap what happens here at all. But if we were decaying from 1.2 down to 0, after one time constant, we'll have gotten 2 thirds of the way there, which will mean we have gotten 0.8 volts down. So it would be at 0.4 volts is where uh, we would be after one time constant. So yeah, I, I mean, it's good to be able to prove it to yourself this way with like plugging into E um, and just reminding yourself. But the one thing without whatever pluses, minuses, whether you're growing or decaying, it's where am I starting? Where am I finishing? And after one time constant, I will have gotten roughly two thirds of the way there. Or if you really want to be exact, it's two point or, you know, one over E of the way there. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's in a lot of detail and obviously adding in some extra stuff. Um, part A, are there any questions before I move on to part B? Um, yeah, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, is there a reason why in this formula, like at the left corner part, there's a one minus over here? Because it's not on the formula sheet. It's like different. Um, sorry. Yeah, I don't have the formula sheet in front of me. But on the formula sheet, you probably have something like y of t equals y naught e to the negative t over tau. Is that it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's it. And you don't have anything else? Um, I don't think so. So I'm like a little bit curious why we have this part. Um, well, I mean, you've so you've seen you should have seen this one in class at some point. It's ju it's just the difference, like I showed before, between an exponential that's decaying, like well, I mean, they're both decaying in a sense. Like I said, the slope is decaying, but one that's decreasing, which is like that, and one that's increasing asymptotically, which is like the the one I've just drawn here on the graph. Um, and it's just, I mean, if we plug in. The, this one here, e just y naught times e to the negative t over tau. You plug in t equals zero, you get y naught, your initial value. And you plug in a really large t, like much later on, it goes down to zero. So that's why you get that. Whereas in this version, the one minus e to the negative t over tau, if you plug in zero, 
you get one minus e to the zero, which is one minus one, or you get zero. And then if you plug in t is really big, you get one minus zero. So you get your y naught value. So that's just the, the one minus gives you uh, something that's increasing versus decreasing. Um, and then the the thing that was complicated about this one is it's it's kind of, it's not, it's not both. It's like, it is the increasing exponential here. You will have something that looks like one minus e to the negative t over tau, but you're like offset. It'd be like 1.2 volts plus, uh, I guess, 0.3 times one minus e to the negative t over tau. Does that make sense? Yeah, because now at t equals zero, we get one minus one. So it's just 0.3 times zero. So we just get 1.2. And then at t is really large, then we get one minus zero. So just one. And then we get 1.2 plus 0.3 is 1.5. Yeah. So this, even though we don't actually need to write it anywhere, this would be the equation that describes what's happening in this problem. Um, so sorry if my my reasoning there was a little like rushed, um, but that, you know, so it's like kind of that mixture of both. I like to think of these rather than, I mean, obviously we're, we're taking an exam, we're gonna be looking at our formula sheet and it's good to, to, like that is a tool you have and you should use it, but I prefer to approach these problems trying to kind of like build up the equation. I know they're gonna have this e to the negative t over tau term, and then I know that what comes out in front is going to determine like what the actual thing does. So it's good to be able to kind of practice with yourself and say, okay, well, is it growing or shrinking? Do I need this type of term or this type of term? What's my initial value? What's my final value? And, and see what comes out of it. I know that's a lot to do on an exam, but I, I think it's really good to practice asking yourself as you work through these. Um, Got it. Thank you. Yep. All right. I'm going to clear this work here um, and I'll, talk about um do you want me to do part b as well or just a i had another question about a yeah go for it you've solved or uh just done it with the or equation with e instead of the delta v equals q over c yeah well i i guess i used both because the delta v equals q over c i needed to get the initial voltage the 1.2 volts um because i'm not given a voltage so i had to i had to solve for that the delta V equals Q over C is, is still true at every point. So like we could use it to solve. Well, actually, why don't we, maybe this this is good to, to move on to the next part. Obtain an expression Q over T for the charge on the positive plate as a function of time. So we know, like I, so actually maybe we did need that. I My voltage equation that I wrote out, my delta V C absolute value as a function of time, I said was... 1.2 volts plus 0 0.3 volts times 1 minus e to the negative t over tau. So now we don't want voltage, we want charge. So like we said, delta Vc equals q over c. And we're looking for q. So q is just equal to delta Vc times c. And so all I need to turn this into a charge equation is to multiply by the capacitance. So if I multiply by C on both sides, then I'll get my Q as a function of T. And so I'm just dropping the absolute value sign here because it's asking for the charge on the positive side. So I'm just gonna say, okay, it's positive. If it asks for the charge on the negative side, I would just toss a negative out front. Um, but you know, charge is, is positive or negative. So uh, yeah, my capacitance is 0.1 farad. So if I multiply that here, I'll get 1.12 uh, coulombs plus uh, 0.1 times 0.3. So I guess times 0.03 coulombs times one minus e to the negative t over tau. And now we get the same thing where we evolve from 0.12 coulombs to 0.15 coulombs, which would be the charge on the capacitor or on the positive side of the capacitor when it is full or when the system has reached its um, capacity. Um, so yeah, this. So I guess they were expecting you to do this in this problem. This this is is definitely tricky um, because it's it's not only like <laughs> you you only get this basically this little piece on your equation sheet. Um, but we had to build up the rest of it. So that only goes to argue more that you should 
you should really practice building these equations up. And even when you know you have it, or like the, it's, it seems very straightforward, just just take the take the extra minute or so to just check, okay, does this make sense? What value do I get at t equals zero? And what value do I get at t equals infinity? And those are really the only two things you need to check. As long as it uh, has the right starting value and it has the right ending value, and you have this term, this exponential decay term, then it's then kind of everything is going to automatically work out. So it's just those honestly two things you need to check: start value, end value, and and from there it's a bit of a puzzle. But um, this I can't see it really getting any more tricky than than what's what's done here. Is there um, a reason the that you like? Sorry, is there a reason that you put the zero point three over here, like the zero point three voltage? Um, I did 0 0.3 because um, it's, I knew my final value was 1.5 volts. Mm -hmm. So I knew that when T equals huge, like when T is infinity, whatever, that I would need mm -hmm. 1.2 plus 0.3, you know? Um, oh, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. What, I mean, another way I could do it. Yeah, I mean, it's a little tough. You could set up some sort of equation where you said like, where you might write like, um, I know that at T is really large, I need my voltage to be 1.5 volts because that's the voltage on the capacitor. So then I could say like equals 1.2 volts, which is my initial plus some value X or something, you know, plus yada, 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 and like solve for that, um, which you would just get what 0.3. So yeah, that, that was, that was a tricky step. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, Question about, like typically, um, isn't the the term that you're multiplying like times the all the like exponential stuff in the parentheses supposed to be your v naught, which is like I mm -hmm. guess your your max value? So why wouldn't you just multiply it by one point five directly? Like yeah, it's not great. for the fact that you started at one point two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, it would be that equation is perfectly valid in this context. And I, the difference is really just what we call t equals zero. So actually, this might unlock a different way of solving this. Um, let me just draw real quick our, our like a rough sketch of our graph. So we got something like that, right? And that was the weird equation that I wrote. But if we kind of went back in time, like back to when this capacitor was empty, right? When it starts at v equals zero, and then evolves up to whatever its final value is, this equation here would in fact be 1.5 times 1 minus e to the negative t over tau. But the only problem here is that uh, if you plug in t equals 0, you get 0. So like you know, it's just an offset. Maybe another way of doing it would be you could take this equation and say that I know that at t equals 0, I need my voltage to be 1.2. So then I would set equals 1.5 times 1 minus e to the negative, so like 0, essentially, because I'm saying it's at time 0, um, plus x, yeah, to see like what offset I wanted. To. So I guess this would really just be solving, and you would get 1.2 out of it. Um, so sorry, maybe, if, maybe I'm not sure if my what I was just trying to explain was helpful. But, but yeah, the, the only difference is, that this equation is still totally right. It's just since they demand that at t equals zero, we don't have a voltage of zero, but we have a voltage of one point two. That's the that's the catch. Okay, that makes sense. But and also, um, for like most charging cases, I feel like I've usually seen it start in the in the negative quadrant. Is that mm -hmm. just not the case here because they gave us the initial voltage or the initial charge? Yeah, and I mean, in a charging case, it can it can kind of always be. Um, both ways. The reason you often see it negative, and, and maybe that would be a better way to write it. I haven't looked at the, the answer key to this. I don't know which way they did it. If especially like since I labeled like absolute value of VC, then that we were very clear, but it's negative while charging because since current's going this way, it's going from positive to negative. So that would be a, a drop. Um, and then when it's discharging, since the capacitor determines the current, it goes the other way and we get minus to plus. So that's why it's positive. But um, yeah, I don't know, it's kind of, it's not arbitrary, but but I think it, it, I don't know, I prefer to just draw things on the positive, on the positive axis. 
So if I have a way to, by just writing absolute value or something, I'm, I'm, tend, I'm going to tend to do that. Um, and it, unless they very specifically ask otherwise, you should be totally fine regardless of how you write it. Again, as long as it's specific. If you just wrote positive out of nowhere and didn't didn't make a note that it was absolute value or something, then I could see I could see that not being given full credit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? I see one in the chat here. Um, okay, so I yeah. Have a question about part A. Yeah, go for it. When you did, when you had the equation um, e negative t over tau is equal to e to the negative one, how did you how did you get negative one, and why was v not not included in that? Yeah, so the the that I was just kind of the reason v v one could have been there. Um, so yeah, why don't why don't I include it? I was so if our equation is v equals v not times e to the negative t over tau. I was just showing that when we plug in t equals tau, so when v of t equals tau will be equal to v naught times e to the negative tau over tau, which that cancels to negative 1. And so that's equal to v naught times 1 over e, or v naught over e. So that's why. Um, so this is just showing that like when t equals tau, the value of v or the value of whatever you have is either one third or in the case of the one minus e to the negative. So you would get one minus one over e, which is two thirds. Either way, it's it's it ends up being you are one third away from your final value or two thirds of the way there, however you want to think of it. Um, but you've crossed more than half of the, the distance, if that makes sense. And which then how did you know to set t equal to tau? What part of the what part of the question asked or was oh, like an yeah. indicator that you needed to do that? The indicator for me was that it said label the time constant, including its value. So maybe, yeah. So I guess that was the thing is is label the time constant. So that's that's what told me to like how to find it, right? So if this was my graph, if I just picked like, all right, here's my time constant, tau, that would be wrong because tau doesn't occur like right when it's almost completely done, tau has to occur somewhere around here. So the reason I went on and went and evolved that was so I could find what is my voltage at time t equals tau. And I said, okay, my voltage then is about 1.4 volts or you know two thirds of the way from 1.2 to 1.5. Then I can trace it over and find out that, okay, it's about here. Gotcha, thank you. Sorry, I have a really good question. If you are trying to draw a discharging diagram for mm -hmm. um for VC for the voltage of the capacitor, how will you do it? Uh like, like a graph for that or like a circuit? Uh, uh, uh like a graph for that. For a graph, it's very well, I mean it's a, it's similar. Like you have the same axes, you have VC and tau or in time. Now you have my your, your starting voltage is, is whatever it was. So here it'd be like 1.5 volts it, if we started when the capacitor was fully charged up. And then our ending, we would know it, it would asymptotically approach zero, right? Something like that. And then we just, again, label the time constant. So the time constant doesn't change. Regard, like it, it doesn't matter whether we're charging or discharging. It still just depends on these two values. So again, our time constant would be tau equals one second. And I picked here because it's roughly, well, it's not that roughly, but it would have to be a roughly two thirds of the way there. So in this case, it would be at 0.5 volts because going from 1.5 down to zero, that's a distance of 1.5 volts. So one over E uh, or like, you know, two thirds of that way, or if we wanted to be better, uh, one minus one over E of the way there or one over E times 1.5 volts, all of these are the same way, are different ways of saying the same thing, it would be roughly roughly a half a volt. So it's always positive curve? Well, so that, that's another, in this case, I could have VC without absolute value and it is positive because when a capacitor is discharging, it determines the direction of the current. 
right? So this is plus, this is minus. In this case, the current would indeed flow this way. And we would be going from negative to positive. So that would be a positive voltage drop. Um, and so I don't need the absolute value. So yeah, I mean, it whether voltage is positive or negative depends on your definition of initial and final. So as we've seen, like generally you're gonna do, especially in a simple circuit like this, you're going to use the loop rule in the direction of the current, right? And so it's natural to give the sign of VC the direct like the 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 sign that it should have depending on which way the current flows. But even though the current is flowing this way, there's nothing that stops me from doing like Kirchhoff, Kirchhoff's rule like between here and here saying this is my initial and this is my final. It's not the way the current's flowing, but it's it's still true that the voltage drop between it, this initial and this final is negative. So the you know, I don't want to say it's not important because you should be able to do this like this reasoning should make sense to you when it's positive and negative. However, it is arbitrary in the sense that our decision of what to call initial and final is 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 our choice. Again, there's a convenient way to do it, but it's not like there's nothing inherently right about it, um, if that makes any sense. But generally, discharging capacitor voltage is positive. Charging capacitor voltage voltage is negative because it's like we're fighting against what wants to happen. Um, but yeah, doing the the absolute value is a nice way to simplify it if you can, unless it like very specifically asks you not to or something like that. Good. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions on circuit capacitor type stuff? All right, let's go and take a new question. Um, let's see. Um, all right. I see in the chat, someone wants to see problem two from the multiple choice final. Let's see. Oops, not what I intended to do. Sorry, I have a lot of windows on a small laptop screen. Hear that. Um, what is what is the MC final? Oh, the last practice is the only MC final. Let's try that. Um, is this multiple choice or is that not what would they mean by MC? Does anyone know what the deal with that is? It said MC final. I don't know what that means. I think you clicked on the wrong one. You're on final oh. six right now. Gotcha. Is it this one? I think so. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, this looks more like it, yeah. All right, so this problem here, the circuit one, is what someone asked about. So let's run through this. Um, and it's good, because we're already on circuits, and this is a one without a capacitor, at least that I can see. Um, okay, so the problem statement, it pretty much just tells us all the things that are labeled in the diagram. So first question, what is the EMF of battery two? Uh, okay, so. Um, we are, it looks like we are given everything except that. <laughs> so everything else in the, I mean, obviously they haven't solved for the currents for us, but we do know the EMF of the other battery and of then the resistances of all the resistors. So um, right away, I mean, this is, the way I'm doing this is, is just going to be like the thing that strikes me first, but I'm seeing that there's a loop rule that just goes all, all around the outside and goes through no resistors and only goes through these EMFs. So going through, and so here's my positive and my negative, here's a negative and positive. So being very careful about that because in EMF, if we go negative to positive, we'll give us plus that many volts. But if we go positive to negative, we'll give us minus. So the way, let's just go with the way I've drawn my loop. For EMF1, we're going positive to negative. So I should have minus 
epsilon one. And then when I go through EMF two, I have a minus to plus, which is uh, plus positive epsilon two. And because that makes the full loop, that equals zero. And here I didn't even need to pay attention to the currents. In fact, it looks like I'm going against both labeled currents, but it really doesn't matter. Those don't affect um, my loop rule being true or not. And the kind of obvious result of this is just that I get epsilon one is equal to epsilon two. So that tells us that the EMF of battery two is nine volts. Um, an EMF is never negative. Um, yeah, so that's that's that. Um, let's move on down the page a little bit, clear that. Um, sorry, it doesn't look like this is advanced enough to like make my drawing stick to whatever's happening. What is the current in resistor three? All right, current in resistor three. So now we have, uh, let's just take a look at this bottom loop right here. So now we know the voltage of this battery, which is nine volts. And this loop now is only going to involve this battery and um, this resistor. So we know that delta V three, so the voltage drop across resistor three plus epsilon two equals zero, right? Those are the only two things in our loop. So we have minus I3 R3 plus epsilon two equals zero. We know epsilon two is nine volts and R3 is 10 ohms. So we have minus I3 times 10 ohms plus nine volts equals zero. And then finally we can solve this and we'll find that I3 equals 0.9 amps. And I mean, in this case, I, I was careful. I, I didn't explain how I was careful, but I was careful and I made sure that the signs would work out. I kind of just went, I drew my loop in the direction that they tell us I3 is traveling. Um, but if I didn't, and because, you know, I'm, I'm doing this problem because I want to tell you the concepts, but also like give a little exam advice. If I had mixed this up and I had accidentally just used a plus or I used a minus epsilon two, something like that. I got some weird values. The numbers here should always still work out to give me plus or uh, to give me plus or minus 0.9 amps, right? So the correct answer is positive nine amps. But if I had accidentally got minus or something like that, um, I mean, looking at the answers here, only positive nine amps is an answer. So then I, I you know, I could go ahead and probably assume that that's that's right, and then maybe like go back and and figure it out. Um, yeah, so I don't know, however helpful that was, I would, you know, do your best in these and take the answer that's closest. Um, why did we go counterclockwise? Um, oh, there, I, for numbers, so the, in number seven, so the first part I did, the reason I went counterclockwise was just because that's the way I happened to draw the circle first. Um, because there was only two batteries in it, I knew that they they would you know they would just have to cancel each other out it doesn't particularly matter in 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 these problems you you can pick whatever direction um you want and no if we went if i went the other way so if i went clockwise instead i would just get um or did i go counterclockwise before well whatever it is i would get one epsilon being positive and one epsilon, i would get something like either the two equations that can result are this minus epsilon one plus epsilon two equals zero or epsilon one minus epsilon two equals zero. And both of these give the exact same thing, which is this. Um, if we went the other way for the loop for down here, so if we went this way, uh, this way, yeah. If we went opposite the current in problem eight, we can try that real quick. We would get minus I3 R3 uh, and then through the battery, we would going, we'd be going from plus to minus. So then I get minus epsilon two equals zero. And so I would get uh, minus I3 times 10 ohms minus nine volts equals zero. And I would indeed find I3 equals negative 0.9 amps. However, we can see that the direction that I drew my, like when you get a negative current, a negative current doesn't really 
I say exist, like sure it exists, but really all it means is that the current is going opposite to the way you've drawn your loop. So in this case, I drew my loop so that the current was going from right to left through this resistor. Since I got a negative value, all that means is that the actual current is 0.9 amps going the other way, right? So like plus and minus here, there's not some like deep conceptual reason. It's just forward and back. So it's just like a revert, an Uno reverse card is having a, a negative in there. So whenever you do these problems, even if they gave us no labels for currents whatsoever, the you can just pick a loop rule. So like whatever I pick for any part of this circuit, and I'm sure we'll get through, we'll get other examples of this, but let's say I purposely went through this loop here. And if you look, that's going opposite the current here and it's going, but it's going in the same direction as the other two. All that tells me is that whatever current I get here is probably gonna end up be for I1 is probably going to be negative because we know I1 is going the other way. It's going opposite our loop. So yeah, that's that's what the sign of the current means. But current, especially when you're being asked for it in a problem here is always um, positive or it should be. Cause if you tell like the better way to tell someone a current is give a positive number and tell them the correct direction. If you say, the direction of the current is going from left to right or clockwise or whatever, and it's negative seven, it's like, okay, don't make, that's a, just saying like, it's not, not this, just give me the, the actual thing, um, if that makes any sense. Okay, um, what is the equivalent resistance of this circuit? Okay, this is a bit of a tricky question. Um, because, well, I guess you should get the same answer, but um, it's tough because it's like the thing that comes to my head first is is from what perspective, like from epsilon one, from epsilon two, and it turns out it doesn't matter because they're, you know, they're connected to the same circuit, but but let's give it, let's give it a shot. Let's, let's pick epsilon two as our reference here and see how we would, would approach this. So I see, Let's just, again, pick a loop rule. Let's go from, let's go clockwise. So we're going this way. I can see that I have two parallel branches. The current can either go this way or this way. So I need to combine those two parallel branches. This branch on the bottom only has R3, so that's nice and simple. But this one has R1 and R2. So to get an R12, I need to use my equivalent resistance uh, for parallel resistors, or sorry, for series resistors rule. So I don't know why I drew what I just did, that's wrong. I just need R12 is just the sum of R1 and R2, right? Sorry, not plus, equals R12 equals R1 plus R2. 16 plus 24 we get is equal to 40 ohms. Now I can do the other thing I was gonna do where I drew my REQ for the whole circuit, which is just the equivalent resistance of now these two parallel branches is equal to one over one, I'm sorry, not that. I'm just combining a bunch of ways to do this. One over R12 plus one over R3. So this is the equivalent resistance of one branch. This is the equivalent resistance of the other, which is equal to one over 40 ohms plus one over 10 ohms. So um, this is equal to one over 40 plus four over 40. And I'm rushing through the math because it's not really relevant here. So we get five over 40. So it, we're gonna end up with REQ equals 40 over five, which is eight ohms, which makes sense. I mean, the, the one check that I always like to do is REQ should be smaller than any of the individual branches, the equivalent resistance of any of the individual branches, and it is indeed smaller than 10 and 40. So our REQ should be um, eight ohms. Do you not consider the other battery in that? Uh, no, because the other, I mean, you will, yeah, I mean, the battery doesn't provide resistance. Um, so that doesn't, yeah, so I, I just wouldn't. Um, the the way you could consider it is if you just did the problem from the perspective of epsilon one instead, you would get the same answer because you still have the same two branches hooked up in the same way. Um, yeah, I, to, I'm not a fan of the posing of this question because like you, it's kind I don't know, yeah. It's kind of like, 
we've only talked about REQ in the sense of like what the battery feels, if that makes sense. And here it's kind of right ambiguous to me. Um, anyway, For sure. I, yeah, I mean the 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 real effect, the thing that I think is all right. So here here's this. I guess I wouldn't expect you to be able to like do like anyone to say this on a final exam, but I believe this circuit will work the same way. Like, let's take again the perspective of epsilon two. It should work the same way whether or not epsilon one is here. So, like, let's say we just cut the circuit off here and here. All of the math I did would still be true. The only difference now is that, uh, like, they're I guess both batteries are kind of doing their own thing. If you want to think of it that way, with the with the with the current in here, like epsilon one is contributing some current here, epsilon two is contributing some current, but they're almost independent um i don't know it gets it gets pretty pretty tricky but from this case i i think the best the the easiest way to see it is just like cut out this middle part and find what the req is and, and that's it um okay next we have which statement is true about the current i2 um i'm just going to kind of try to breeze through this i2 equals i1 that is not true right because there's there's a junction in between them so in fact, I1 plus I2 is going to add up to some other current. We don't. We have no idea that they should be equal. I2 equals I3. Same deal. I2 goes here and splits up between I3 and, and the other direction. So like I2 is going this way and splitting this way. So I2 and I3 should not be equal. Um, I2 equals I3 plus I4. Uh, that doesn't really makes sense to me, right? Because I3 channels into I4. So like I3 plus I4, we'd be like, I4 is I3 plus whatever this I is, right? So if we did I3 plus I4, we're kind of like weirdly double counting I3 and ignoring this one. So I don't, that one doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I2 equals I4 minus I3. Let's take a look at that. Well, it, or the last one, none are true. Um, so I2 equals I4 minus I3. Well, let's see where I2 actually goes. So I2 becomes, as we said before, I3 and this other I. We'll call this Ix. So we know I2 equals I3 plus Ix. And then here over here, we see I3 and Ix come together to equal I4. So we know I4 is actually equal to I3 plus Ix as well. So I2 and I4 are actually equal, not by some weird combination of these. So um, I'm going to say they're all false. I don't know that that's, and so yeah, I've, I mean, I'm pretty confident in my answer, but just so everyone knows, I have not seen, I have not looked at the solutions to any of these. I don't have them in front of me. So if you hear me say something, give an answer that is not, <laughs> that the solutions do not consider correct, please let me know. Um, all right, what is the power dissipated? And sorry, the my reasoning for that is not, I mean, well, I won't lie. It's a little bit of laziness, but mostly it's because I think it's more helpful to see me like actually solve the problem instead of just kind of regurgitate what the answer is. Um, okay, anyway, what is the power dissipated by resistor two? Um, and it gives us these power expressions. Okay, R2. So um, we need either the voltage or the, or sorry, the, the current resistance voltage. We, we have the resistance. We need one other thing, right? Because all the power expressions have some combination. Why don't I zoom out so we, I don't have to keep going back and forth. All of the power expressions have some, some other thing. It's either I and V, I and R, or V and R, whatever. So let's see, is it easier to get the current in R2, or is it easier to get the voltage drop across R2? I think it's the current, because the way I would get the voltage drop is probably first by finding the current. So if I'm going to get the current, let's just use our loop rule in this top segment here. Let's do like that. So I have epsilon 1 minus I1 R1 minus I1 R2 where these two have the same current because they're in series, right? And then that goes to zero because then we complete our loop. So this is nine volts minus, and then this, I mean, I'm gonna skip some math here, but it's just I1 times 
R1 plus R2, which is 40 ohms. And so we find that I1 is equal to 9 over 40 amps. Um, and there is not, uh, no, any, I, so someone asked, is there a scenario where you can't just look at a smaller loop to solve a problem, like where you like maybe have to involve more? And I'll, I'll give a qualified no to that, meaning that maybe a small loop would be insufficient, as in like you could do it and do it correctly, and you just don't end up getting the answer out that you needed, as in like you get the answer to something else. But as long as you are correct about which currents you write here, so you know I wrote I1 for both of these because they both have I1 passing through, and that's, you know, did that well, you're never going to go wrong. And so I would always suggest try to use the simplest loop, or maybe even better than simplest, the loop that uses the most information that you already have and uses the least information that you don't have, right? Ideally, we want a loop where the only thing missing is the one thing that we want, which is the case for the loop that I drew here, right? Everything else we know except I1, the thing that I'm looking for. Um, if I had drawn, for instance, this loop, right? This one that goes through all the resistors, that's totally correct. And it might give us our answer because I1 is involved in this loop. However, I don't know I4, I don't know I2. Well, I know they're equal, but I don't know what they are. And I3, well, I did solve for it, but now that's another number. I could have gotten it wrong, whatever. So that one is no less correct, but it is more difficult to use. So no, there's no, there's not a scenario where like a smaller loop is wrong. It just might be more difficult. Um, and yeah, if the if we use the middle loop, epsilon would not be a factor. Although it would indirectly, because in order to solve for what i three and i one are, or what i two and i four are, we 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 would need the epsilons. So it wouldn't cut in the act the first equation that I write out, which would be like r three i three r three. Actually, I guess I2 and R and I4 wouldn't come in initially. It would just be like a term that for this and a term for this. But anyway, I'm, I'm making a mess here, but um, they would come in. It would just be more indirect. You'd have to have like this equation leads to another one and you'd end up solving for a bunch of things. Whereas what I picked initially minimizes the amount of work we have to do. So again, when you're picking the loop, pick the smallest one that you can that has the least amount of unknowns except for the thing that you're looking for. OK, anyway, here's our I1. And now it asks for the power dissipation in R2. So we'll pick the power expression that uses the two things that we have, current and resistance. So it's I squared R. So P, uh, whoops, not R, P2, the power dissipated in resistor 2 is I squared, so 9 over 40 squared times R, which is 16. And I guess this would be 40 squared is 1,600. So 16 over 1,600, we get 100. So 9, 81, over, 81 over 100, so this one. That's the type of mental math you can do with a PhD, and that's about it. Um, OK, great. And lastly, what is the fluid system equivalent of a battery? Um, and that the answer to that is pretty straightforwardly just a pump. So the reason being the pump, it, it just adds energy density to the system. A pump gives energy density to volume of liquid or fluid, and um, batteries give energy density to charges. Um, that's yeah, that's pretty much pretty much it. Um, any other questions on this one? I think this is a great, I mean, we're halfway through, but I think we did a, a pretty solid review of circuits just in general. I think we hit most of the things that could come up there. Um, are there any other questions about circuits period before we move on? Okay, um, let's go back to raised hands. Um, how do I see that? I don't know, there's someone that had their, okay, here we go. Hands raised. The first person, hang on, let me get back to my clicker. 
I think the first person that raised their hand was perhaps William H. If I'm reading that correctly, William, can you <laughs> honor system here? Have you had your ra hand raised for a while? Oh no, that's not right. That was wrong hand. It's either, let's go with Elise. Sorry. I was looking at all the participants. Elise, you can go ahead and ask your question. Uh, could you do practice final 20, or practice final? From fall 22, question 15. Sure. Um, was that the one that I was just on? Yeah. Um, question 15. Okay, um, so we have two balls of clay colliding with each other. We slide ours toward our friend with some speed, but your friend is at rest, ignore friction. Okay, so we have a five kilogram ball hitting a three kilogram ball that was initially at rest. Um, so let me just label, well, I won't label because I'm gonna move it. Maybe now I'll pick here to stop. So this is moving initially with eight meters per second, and this is still. Question 15 asks, if the clay ball exert, clay balls exert equal and opposite forces on each other, if they, they have to, um, and the collision takes, what is it? three? <laughs> this notation is very confusing to me, but I'm gonna assume that means 0 0.03 seconds, not three seconds. Yeah, that must be it. Um, so three hundredths of a second, what is the magnitude of the force that each clay ball exerts on the other? So for this, we have, um, this is a like a, a, a momentum problem, excuse me. So um, a force comes in to play from our momentum problems as the way it delivers impulse. And that is by the change in momentum. So our impulse is equal to the force times the change in time, right? So it's force applied over time gives us a change in momentum, an impulse, which is exactly, yeah. So now we have a way to relate information that we're given, which is momentum information. Well, it's the beginnings of momentum information to um, the force that we're looking for. So Things I already see I have, 0.3 seconds, that tells us what our delta T is, right? So now the only thing I need to figure out is delta P. And I'm looking for the change in mag the change in momentum for each one of the balls, and they should be equal and opposite. If I went for delta P total, right, maybe that's your first inclination. It's like, well, well it's asking about the whole system or like both of the balls or either of them. Um, why wouldn't it be delta P total? Well, there's no external forces, so delta P total is zero because um, the force one ball exerts, as the problem states, is equal and opposite to the one the other ball exerts. So the total force within the whole system is zero. So let's just focus on uh, what the force from one onto the other would be. And to do that, we need to learn actually what's going to happen in the collision. So let's look at our, let's draw a momentum chart. So we have P initial, delta P, P final, and we have ball one, and we have ball two, and we have total. Sorry, this is getting more and more crooked as I make more lines, but I think it'll do okay. So we know total change in momentum is zero. I already had that. Let's uh, label these balls. Let's say this is one, this is two. So one nice thing we know is that one starts with an initial momentum of zero. Um, and that is, okay. Oh, and then something else we need to know, I was looking for it. Problem 13 tells us that they stick together, which is important because we need to know about the final state of the system. Um, this is interesting because I, I think it's interesting because if they didn't stick together, like let's say they bounced off each other, these forces actually might be different. 
So like no matter what, they're going to be equal and opposite. That ensures that we have conservation of momentum. However, how large they are, they're always going to be opposite. And they're always going to cancel. But for instance, the ball, like let's say they were pool balls, the balls could bounce off each other and go in opposite directions. Those forces would be greater than the forces that exist here for two clay balls that stick together, uh, but they still cancel out um, because less energy goes into the, you know, is absorbed. Anyway, so it's important that they stick together. Ball two has some initial momentum M2 V2. And so our total momentum is just zero plus M2 V2. And I'm ignoring that it's going to the left here. I'm just calling left positive because we know they're going to stick and keep going to the left. So I don't feel like carrying around the negative sign. Um, next, we know that since there's no change in momentum total, that the final total momentum has to be the same as the initial total momentum. And then, um, yeah, so then finally, the, the thing we know is that they stick together. So they both have the same V final. So we know M1 is going, or mass one is going to be M1 V final. Mass two is going to be M2 V final. And so now we have everything we need to solve for the change for either one of them. M2 goes from M2 V2 to M2 V final, whereas M1, which is even easier, goes from zero to M1 V final. So really the change that we're looking for, delta P, is just M1 V final minus zero, which is also equal to M2 V final minus M2 V initial or V2. It's just easier because you know there's less there's less math. But those both those have to be the same. Those are the equal and opposite changes in momenta um, for these two balls. So anyway, here's our change in momentum. Now, how do we solve for it? Because we don't actually know what this V final is. Well, we know we have this column now. We know that M1 V final plus M2 V final equals M2 V2, or M2 V initial. Um, so sorry, this is getting a little, a little messy here. I'm going to erase this so I can keep solving. OK, so now we can plug in. We know M1 is three kilograms, so three kg times V final, which we don't know, plus five kg times V final, which we don't know, that's M2 V final, equals M2 V2. So M2 is five kilograms, V2 is eight meters per second, the initial, so this is going to be 40 kilogram meters per second. And now I can solve here and I find V final so three plus five is equal to eight V final, divide the eight out, V final is equal to five meters per second. So now I can take this V final, plug it in here, and I'll find that my delta P for ball one is equal to M1, which is three kilograms times V final, which is five meters per second. So it's 15 kilograms meters per second. So ball one went from having no momentum to 15 kilogram meters per second. Last step. And so as a result, we know delta P for ball one is going to be negative 15 kilogram meters per second, but that's not important. Lastly, for ball to get the force, we know that this equals F delta T. We know delta T here is equal to 0 0.03. So force is going to be equal to 15 divided by 0 0.03. Newtons, which is uh, 500, right? I think, yeah. So it should be 500 Newtons. When the balls collide, ball two exerts a force of 500 Newtons to the left on ball one. And as a result, ball one exerts a force of 500 Newtons to the right on ball two. So total force is zero and they cancel out. Yeah. Um, yeah, the notation is is weird. That's not the right. That, this, this I think if it was in this notation, it should still be something like, like something like that. But we've never used this in class, so I don't. I think you can count on not seeing that on the final. And if you do, there should be a clarification. Um, Fifteen meters per second came from I found the final speed v final to be five meters per second. So p final for this ball for one was equal to 
m1 times the final, which is three times five, three kilograms times five meters per second. Um, is it true that if the objects stick together, the collision is inelastic? Um, yes, if collision, if the objects stick together, that is as inelastic as can be. We just call it perfectly inelastic. In other words, as much kinetic energy is lost as is possible to still conserve momentum. Um, anything else, if they bounce off, they could be, it's, it's either elastic or partially elastic. Um, and you are expected to know um, elasticity and, and inelasticity, but it's, it's really, the it's really just a couple pieces of knowledge you need for in, like and I'll I'll summarize it right now between the two elasticity like perfect elasticity means kinetic energy is conserved so total initial kinetic energy equals final total kinetic energy inelasticity um, or perfect inelasticity means the maximum amount of kinetic energy which is lost which that is is hard to to tell, like you can't just immediately write down what that amount is that's lost, but when something is perfectly inelastic, they stick together. So often if you're told they stick together um, or told that the collision is inelastic, the, the key is that the objects have the same final speed because they're stuck together. So if they're stuck together, it is inelastic. Yeah, thanks. Um, we are using M1 to find P final because I'm just looking for the final momentum of M1. So in this expression, I'm, I'm P final one is the mass one times its final speed. P final two, P final two would be mass two times V final, where these V finals are the same because they're stuck together. And so P final total would be the sum of those two, or you could also think of it as a single object with a mass that's the sum of those two times v final. It's the same thing. Um, 16, we'll do that because we're still here. You and your friend repeat the same scenario, replacing the clay balls with bowling balls. Okay, great. This sounds elastic with the same masses. Um, same starting velocity, same setup. Okay, this time the balls collide perfectly elastically. Great. What is the final velocity of the th three kilogram bowling ball? Um, okay, so for this one, um, we, I'm, yeah, since you asked how we would go about solving it, and I, it's just going to be a bunch of math, so I'm actually not going to do the whole thing, but the way we would go about solving it is to so remember when I was doing my momentum chart, the thing that allowed me to complete it was the fact that I knew that they had the same V final. If I didn't, if they didn't have the same V final, then I would have not enough unknowns to solve any of the equations. However, what I do know is that since the equation, or sorry, since the collision is now elastic, that kinetic energy must be conserved. So my initial kinetic energy has to be the same as my final. My initial is only due to this ball because the, the first one is, is still. So my uh, kinetic energy initial would just be one half M2 V2 initial squared. That would be all of the kinetic energy because the other mass doesn't have any. And then my Ke final would be equal to one half M1 V1 final squared plus one half M2 V2 final squared and yeah, it, so it gets it gets a bit messy, but it does give us another equation, and that's the key to being able to solve. Um, if you have two unknowns, you need two equations to solve them. Um, right, delta p being zero, delta p total being zero is not the same as being elastic. If, momentum is always conserved. So as long as there's no external force, delta p total will always be zero, and that tells you nothing about elast elasticity. Um, conservation of momentum is a universal physical law. Conservation of kinetic energy is not. We have conservation of energy, right? When when the collision is elastic and it and it quote unquote loses energy, it's transferred into other types of energy. It's transferred into heat, transferred into sound, etc. Um, but it's not conserved as kinetic. Um, if a ball bounces into a wall, wouldn't momentum not be conserved? Right. In that case, it's just because there's an external force. So if a ball hits a wall and goes back in the other direction, 
obviously momentum is not the same as when it started one direction and initially it was going to the right then it's going to the left but um yeah that's because the wall had an impulse in that case we don't know whether it's elastic or inelastic um well we know it's not perfectly inelastic because the ball didn't stick to the wall the perfectly inelastic case would be the ball sticking to the wall um but whether it's perfectly elastic or not you either have to be told or you're given some other information that lets you solve for the initial and final kinetic energy and then you can figure out whether or not it's elastic. Um, yeah, so inelastic is a lot easier to see. It's just if they stick. Elastic, you, there's no there's no dead giveaway other than being told or like, like we did here, or you have to check yourself. Is the initial kinetic energy the same as the final? There's no other way to tell. Um, any other questions on this problem or topic? Um, okay, if not, my next hand raised I see is from Thasuni. Hi, I was wondering if you could go over um, problem four on the same exam, please. Yeah, problem four. So is that this one? Yeah. Okay, sure. Um, all right, so we have a collision between two identical spherical balls with same radius and mass, and they have equal and opposite velocities. However, their centers are offset. Okay, um, wow, this is something that we don't see a lot. Okay, what are the magnitudes of the initial linear momenta of each ball? Um, okay, great, so this one's nice and easy. We know momentum is equal to mass times velocity. So let's just pick one, and it's, it's asking for magnitude, so we don't need to worry about direction. So let's just pick one of the balls, the magnitude of the momentum is going to be equal to its mass, which is one kilogram times its speed or magnitude of its velocity, same thing, um, which is 25 meters per second. So it should just be 25 kilogram meters per second. Um, the negatives here, just to throw you off, a negative, uh, sorry, I, magnitude can never be negative. Okay. Um, what are the initial angular momenta vectors of each of the two balls around their combined center of mass? Okay. Which is halfway between the centers of the two balls. Um, okay. Angular momenta vectors. Okay, so, and then they give us this angular momentum is equal to our perpendicular times momentum. So to make this easier, let's I'm going to draw a simplified drawing here where so we just have this, this is our center of mass point. And then we have one of the balls that's traveling. Let's take this one again from right to the left right here. And so we need two ingredients for in order to find the angular momentum. We need our perp, so the perpendicular distance, right? So we have this we know the distance of the ball from the center of mass is, is changing. It's this diagonal line, but the perpendicular distance, which I've also drawn here on the right, is not changing. That's just the, the, the distance between the kind of path of the ball and the center of mass. So it's nice that it doesn't change because we know like there's such a thing as conservation of angular momentum. And we don't, if the ball is just traveling in a straight line, there's no external torques acting on it. Its momentum should be constant, not changing. And it is because while the r, this distance is changing, the r perpendicular is not. Okay, so let's just figure out what that r perpendicular is. That's one half of the recipe. And then the other half is the momentum, which we already have here. And we found it's 25 kilogram meters per second. Um, so what is this r perpendicular? Well, the balls have a radius of 0.1 meters and their centers are offset by 0.14 meters. So they're telling us the distance between the two paths here, the distance between the center of the two balls is 0.14 meters, and the distance between the middle of the ball and the edge of the ball is one meter. Uh, but we're really what we want is halfway between the centers 
of the two balms. So we want the distance between the path and there. So actually the radius of the ball doesn't matter. We know that the full distance between the two paths B is 0.14 and we want half of that, which gives us the like halfway between the two. So it's just gonna be 0 0.07, right? So we'll say R perp, R perp is equal to 0.14 meters over two equals 0 0.07. Now L is just that times L is equal to R perpendicular times P, which is 0 0.07 times 25 kilogram meters per second, uh, which should equal uh, 1.75 kilogram meters squared per second, I think. Yeah. Um, OK, oh wait, and then the direction. So hang on. Um, we know the magnitude is 1.75 kilogram meters squared per second. Now, for directions, well, um, I think my video is on, right? Yeah, you should be able to see this. So let's take the ball on the bottom first. So the ball that I've been working with, this one on the right, bottom right. The way we do angular momentum, we wrap our fingers in the direction that the ball is like rotating, which is weird because the ball is, is going in a straight line. But if we imagine like the, if we imagine that as a part of a, like a circular path or like an angular path, this ball is going like around this way, right? It's clockwise, it's passing underneath and below. So if we wrap our fingers in the clockwise direction, we'll see our thumb is pointing into the page for that one. And then the other one, this ball, is going around the top, kind of like this, even though, again, it's a straight line, it's going roughly like that. And then if we wrap our fingers there, we'll also see our thumb is still going into the page. So they're both, even though they're traveling in opposite linear directions, they're both traveling in a direction, they both have angular momentum with respect to this point that is into the page. So our answer is indeed C, both have the same magnitude and it's both and they're both into the page. Um, I have two questions that came up. Is P the same thing as F here? Um, no, it's not quite the same, again, because we don't have the time. So momentum, well, actually, it's, it's, it's different altogether. P is equal to MV. That doesn't have a direct relation to F, because that's your, mo that's your instantaneous momentum. When it does relate to force is when you have delta P is equal to F delta T. If we had a change in momentum and that occurred over a change in time, then that's related to a force. A force causes a change in momentum, um, but there's no direct, like just given a momentum, you can't get a force. And just given a force, you can't get a momentum. But given a force and an amount of time over which it acts, you can get the moment, the change in momentum or the impulse that it delivers. Um, and then the other thing was to repeat how we got um, half of 1.4 to get our perp. Um, the reason, why don't I clear this off? The reason was um, what we're told is that the, the distance we're looking at, the, the point that we want the angular momentum about is the center of mass, which is halfway between the centers of the two balls. So this point here, which is halfway between the centers of the two balls, we want the perpendicular distance for each of them. So it's just going to be the distance between the center of mass and the path that they're on. Right. So even though the distance from the center of mass to the center of a ball is not a number we know, we know we all we need to we don't need to know that number. We just need to know the vertical distance, the, the perpendicular distance. Um, and it's perpendicular to what? Well, it's perpendicular to the momentum. Since the momenta are left and right, the R perp we're interested in is the in this vertical direction. So we're given this value B is equal to 0 0.14, 0 0.14 meters. And we know the center of mass is, is halfway in between these two. So or like here it is, it's along this line. So if this whole distance is 0.4 and we need to know the center of it, then that distance is just is just half. I hope that was helped. 
Um, and how do we know the bottom ball is going that way? Uh, we haven't even we haven't even considered the direction after a collision yet. So all we've all we're talking about so far is just like we can only we can just focus on a single ball at a time. We have a point. One's going like this. The other's going like that. We can think of them individually. In fact, we don't even need to, need to know that they're shaped like pool balls. It's just we have a mass that's centered around this point, moving around another point. Um, and the reason we know it's going that way is because we're told they have equal and opposite velocities and that they're going to collide. And yeah, these arrows are given here too. So we're, we're, we're shown that this ball is going to the left and this ball is going to the right. Um, okay, let's move along to 21. Consider a completely inelastic collision between these two balls. So the final state only has only a single larger ball with a radius of 0.126 meters. What is the magnitude of the final angular momentum of the combined system? Um, well, this one is pretty straightforward. They give us all this extra information, but the important thing to recognize is that uh, very similarly to our momentum and force equation, we know that change in angular momentum is just equal to any external torque times the amount of time that it was applied. And we know that there is no external torque. It's just a collision between two balls in free space. And so if there's no torque, the delta, the change in angular momentum is zero, which tells us that L initial equals L final. So we don't have to worry about the details of the collision. If we find the total angular momentum of the initial state that we just looked at, that will be the same as the angular momentum of the final state. And then lastly, in, um, in problem 20, just before, we found that both of the balls have the angular, the same angular momentum and in the same direction. So we just add them together. We have 1.75 plus 1.75 into the page. And so we get 3.5. Um, and it doesn't even ask us for a direction, but it would be still into the page. So we, all that other detail was unnecessary. Could you what go if over the, how you did the right hand rule for that again? Yeah, yeah, sure. So for the right hand, the way I did the right hand rule with these is you, so even though they're going in a straight line, you can still kind of use your imagination to imagine like the circular element of that, right? So if you like, this ball is going like this, and then it would go like that, you know, like it's, if you had to decide when this ball is directly below, let's, let's think of it like that. When this ball passes directly below, the center of mass, like it's going to come to the left when it's here, it will be moving to the left. So if I put my fingers, curl my fingers in that direction, then my thumb is going into the page, right? Or another way to do that is if you trace the angle out, right? So here's, let's say here's my initial, the ball is initially here, here's the center of mass, the ball's moving this way. As the ball moves from right to left, again, even though it's in a straight line, the angle is sweeping this way. It's going, I guess in this case. I, I got it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks so much. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. So there's that. Now 22. What is the moment of inertia of the final system? I for a solid sphere is two fifths MR squared. Okay. So, I mean, for this one, it tells us in the previous question, the final state has only a larger, a single larger ball with a uh, radius of 0.126. So they just want us to plug it in, right? We just know 2 fifths times MR squared. So the trick here is there's, we know the initial, the mass of the balls was what, uh, one kilogram. So now the, the combined mass when they stick together is of course going to be two kilograms. So our M is two kilograms and uh, R squared is 0.126 meters squared. And so you, I don't have a calculator in front of me, but it would be whatever that is. Um, what is the final angular velocity of the system? Okay. So we now, we have the L final from before, which was this, and we have the moment of inertia, which is whatever it was. I got the radius because in 21, it just tells us that. 
above that the final ball has a single radius of this. Um, and okay, so L final is equal to moment of inertia final times angular velocity final. And I have this and I have this, right? This L final is from 21, I final is from 22. And so I just need to divide L final by I final. And then I'll get my final angular velocity. Um, and actually this is not quite correct because it says velocity, but none of these have directions. So we know it will be into the page because before our L final was into the page, right? Because our L initial was into the page and L final equals L initial. And so if L final is into the page, omega final, angular velocity final is also into the page. That the direction doesn't change. They're just related by this scalar, um, just a number I final, the moment of inertia. So again, I don't know what the actual numerical answer is there, but it would just be the answer of 21 divided by the answer of 22. Okay. Lastly, what was the net external angular momentum impulse on the system? So we've already argued that it has to be that it's zero, right? Because it's just two balls that collide. Angular momentum doesn't change. And as we said before, delta L equals tau delta T. And this number here is just related to the, yeah, is, is related to, to torque, which is zero. Um, so that's, that's it. Um, any other questions on this problem? All right. Um, torque is zero just because there's no external external force. Um, there's, yeah, or sorry, I scrolled way past it, but but the problem doesn't give us, and it's just two balls colliding in free space, so there's no, there's no external torque. Um, and okay, so there's one, I'll, there's one other hand raise. I'll get to you in a sec, but um, I'll go to one question in the chat, which was number six from spring 23. Um, there you go. And I'm hoping this is also on torque. We were just there. I mean, it doesn't matter, but we were just there. Um, oh no, kinematics. All right, this is great too. We'll we'll stay here. Um, yeah, if net torque is not equal to zero, um, and sorry, I know I'm responding to, to messages that are only to me, but someone asked, will it be stated if net torque is not zero? And um, generally yes, or always yes. How clearly, I guess that's, that's up to the reader, but um, keywords to look for are any, like, it might say something like a force. For instance, if there was a, a, a force of gravity or something, I don't know, acting on the balls in, in some way, I don't know, then it could, forces cause torques. And then you would need to know that. So it might not explicitly say there is a torque of blank, but they might say that there's something that clearly causes a force that's acting here. And then it's it'd be up to you to recognize like, oh, okay, that causes a torque. Um, and yeah, if if there is time, then I'll go back to the, the fluid multiple choice. Um, all right, here we go. So consider a block of mass five kilograms sitting at the top of a ramp with an unknown coefficient of friction and certain dimensions. And the block is pushed down a ramp with some initial speed. Um, okay. After two seconds, the block is halfway down the ramp with a speed that is one quarter its initial speed. Um, what is the coefficient of kinetic friction? Okay, so after two seconds, the block is halfway down the ramp with a speed of one quarter its initial speed. So let's first, um, I mean, there's a lot of places we could start, but let's first figure out um, what the, so yeah, let's do a little like fourth body diagram here. So for a free body diagram, we normally call them. So here's the block. There's always gonna be gravity, right? Gravity pulls straight down, always. However, gravity doesn't result, like the result is not the ball, the box going straight down, right? Because this ramp's here, the ramp has some normal force, F normal, and some frictional force. Um, going back, well, that's not exactly relevant right now, but for some frictional force. But the result is that the vertical component of gravity is canceled out, 
right? The the call let's call this. So our new x and y are like this. So here's y, here's x. So the y direction of gravity is canceled out. The ball the block is not going to go into the ramp. It's not going to fly off the ramp. It's just going to stay parallel with the surface of the ramp. The remaining piece of gravity, the piece that's in our negative x direction, is going to to yeah prevail, and the block's going to slide down. But we know that there's also some force due to friction in the opposite direction. So in our x direction, we have friction in one direction and fgx in the other. And despite the way I've drawn them, we know that the block is slowing down, right? Once it's gone halfway down the ramp, it's a quarter of its initial speed. So if the block is slowing down, we know that the acceleration and the net force is then in the negative x direction. In other words, the force of friction is larger than the x direction force of gravity. Gra the gravity is losing here. Gravity wants to pull the block down the ramp faster and faster. However, the friction is causing the block to do the opposite. It's causing it to slow down and come to a stop. So um, let's focus on our x direction, I guess. So in the x direction, I know that, well, first we have F net equals mass times acceleration. Right, and to break that into components, we know that in the x direction, that means F net x equals mass times acceleration in the x direction. And now our F net x is equal to F g x, so the x component of gravity plus the frictional force. And that's equal to M a x. Okay, so now let's plug in what we know. Um, we can solve for the gravitational force, right? So we know Fg as a vector, the force due to gravity is equal to Mg and it's down, right? Mm -hmm. So this, let me draw the triangle here. Gravity is pointing down with a magnitude of Mg. However, we're not interested in this value. We're interested in just the x value here. So this is FGX, this is FGY. So we need to use some trigonometry to find out how if this hypotenuse, the downward component is MG, what is the horizontal component, this X direction component? Um, and so for that, we need an angle. Let's say uh, this angle here, right? We'll call it theta. So here X is our opposite side, it's the side opposite theta. So the force of gravity due to x is going to be mg sine theta. And because our x here, positive is to the right, negative is to the left, this is negative because gravity wants to pull it in the negative x direction. We'll figure out what theta is in a sec, but that's plus the force of friction. And so actually, but let me expand that. So I'm, I think this is either given on your equation sheet, I think, or you'd just be told it. But the way friction works is that it's the normal force times the uh, coefficient of friction. So in this case, we need another, we need to bring in something else. We need the y direction in order to get the normal force. So I kind of jumped the gun going straight to the x direction. Um, so trying to skip no steps here. We have now f net y equals zero. So I'm saying equal. it should be equals may, but that's zero because, again, the block is neither sinking into the ramp or flying off into the air. So f net y equals zero. And f net y is just equal to m, uh, force of gravity in the y direction plus the normal force, which we know have to cancel out. So if we want to solve for the normal force, we need to figure out how much of gravity it needs to cancel out. So now we're actually interested in the y, dire oops, the y direction of gravity, which is instead of mg sine theta is going to be, since this is the adjacent side, mg cos theta. So now this is mg cos theta plus normal force equals zero. And again, gravity is pulling down, not up. So this would be negative. And we get our normal force is equal to mg cos theta times 
uh, or no, that's it. So that, yeah, that's our normal force, mg cos theta. Now we can take this back because we wanted our frictional force, which is equal to the normal force times the coefficient of friction, which we call mu k. That's the kinetic coefficient of friction. So this is going to be negative mg sine theta plus the fric frictional force, which is now mu k times mg cos theta. Um, he said that kinematics equations wouldn't be on the final. That I don't know that. Um, I would be surprised. That's because you have not had a quiz on it. It's usually always on the final. Um, the, I don't know if anyone can confirm or deny that. Oh. Mm, okay. Sorry. I don't. I don't want this to be. Shoot. Instead, it would be mostly graphing. Okay. We wouldn't have to solve the. OK, so it sounds like you won't have to solve the quadratic equation or something. I'm still going to push forward with this because this is also super connected to just like forces. And like so far, what I've been doing is really connected to like static equilibrium stuff. Um, but it's good to know that you won't have to do tons of kinematic stuff. Um, OK. So anyway, now we have our equation here for the acceleration along the uh, what's it called, along the plank. Um, I'll do the geometry super quickly so we don't know what this theta is. This angle here, we'll call this phi, we know is related to like height and like this h and this d. In fact, uh, phi would equal inverse tangent of h over d, opposite over adjacent. Um, and actually we can prove, I, I won't, prove it a ton, but because this angle, phi, is between two lines that are perpendicular to both of these two lines. So this is the theta we're looking at, right? This is the theta for gravity. This line is perpendicular to this line, and this line is perpendicular to this one, which means the angles between them are the same. So actually, phi and the angle theta we're looking for, oh, I don't know what that stopped phi and theta are actually the same angle. So this, this theta here is actually inverse tan h over d. So yeah, I'm not going to write it out because it's super uh, you know, annoying to. Um, however, and this is I can't really make space where I've drawn it. Let me, can I do this? Nope, that doesn't help. Let's just erase a bunch of stuff. All right, so we've gotten to this point. We have our equation for acceleration in the x direction. And what we're looking for is this coefficient of friction, this mu value. So this is an A that I deleted. We're looking for this mu value here. We know mg, theta. We know everything except um, ax and mu k. But there's one piece of information that I haven't taken into account yet, which is that when after two seconds, the block is halfway down the ramp with the speed that is one quarter its initial speed. So this is where kinematics equations come in, because now we have a relationship between speed and acceleration and time. So if you look at your kinematics equations, a very simple one, this is not quadratic. We know that v, velocity at time t, is equal to velocity at time 0, so v initial plus acceleration times time. And so we have all of these things here. We know that our v at time t, so v at two seconds, is equal to one quarter its initial speed. So initial speed is two meters per second. So a quarter of that is equal to 0.5 meters per second. And it should actually, can, the way we set up our axes, it should be negative because right, it's traveling to the left. So V initial is negative 0.5 meters per second. And that's uh, plus, oh no, so that's, that's just that, equals V initial, which is negative 2 meters per second, because initially it was sliding to the left at 2 meters per second, plus acceleration in the x direction times T, which is 2 seconds. So we have 0.5, negative 0.5 equals negative 2 plus A times 2. 
So we can add two to both sides, move this negative two over is another way to say that. So we have 1.5 meters per second equals AX times two seconds. And then finally we can solve AX is equal to 0.75 meters per second squared. So that's how I use my kinematics. Um, and just a tip, because you have three kinematics equations, right? You have one that has position, velocity, and acceleration. You have this one, which has velocity and acceleration. And well, I guess that's really it. You have acceleration is just going to be a constant, um, at least within a given interval. So anyway, I chose this one because I didn't have any distance information. Um, well, I guess I did. I could use this halfway down the ramp and, and use the overall um, equation with distance, but it's unnecessary. I just showed that using only velocity, I can solve for what the acceleration uh, was. Now, I just plug that in here. This is 0.75 meters per second squared. And make careful note that this is positive, right? The acceleration is positive, meaning the acceleration is in the plus x direction because the friction is a larger force than the um, x direction force of gravity. So friction is winning. Even though the acceleration is positive, the block is moving to the left in the negative x direction. So when the acceleration and the velocity are in different directions, we get something that is slowing down, which is exactly what we have here. The box is moving in the negative direction as a negative velocity, but since it has a positive acceleration, it's getting less and less negative. In other words, it's approaching zero, slowing down. Um, and I'll just stop solving here because now everything is in place. We know the mass, we know this acceleration, we know m, g, theta, the only unknown is mu. And so we would solve for that. Um, questions on what I've just done? So maybe I shouldn't have deleted it all before I take any questions. Okay. Um, if not, let me scroll down. Assume, all right, this is good. This is more relevant to what we're going to do. Assume the second half of the ramp is frictionless. Graph both the acceleration versus time and the velocity versus time from when the block is initially pushed to when it reaches the bottom. So I'm going to do this rather roughly, but I'll get all the main points. So we have, let's make this acceleration versus time. And why don't I give myself room for negative for both, even though I might not need it. And here's velocity versus time. So uh, first, let's do acceleration. Going from, and then let's put a point here that this is when the block is halfway down the ramp. We know that happens at two seconds, right? It just tells us that at two seconds is when the block is halfway down the ramp. So um, on the acceleration graph, from the point when the block starts moving to when it reaches the frictionless part at two seconds, we know we already solved our acceleration is this positive 0.75 meters per second squared. We already solved for that. It's just a constant positive acceleration. However, once the block reaches the frictionless side, the frictional force is going to obviously go away. So now all we're left with is the force of gravity in the x direction, which is negative. So that the actual number I didn't solve for because I didn't you know do the math, but we have it's just mg I guess negative mg sine theta is what we said it was, and so whatever that value is, I'll just write it here as f g x over m because I I want the acceleration not the force so f equals m a a would be f over m um, I hope that made sense so from this point until the end which we'll just won't solve for. But until it reaches the end of the ramp, we'll have a negative acceleration. So basically what it's saying is the block slides down the ramp, at first slowing down. So even though it's positive acceleration, it's tricky because it's going in the negative x direction. It's slowing down, and it reaches a quarter of its initial speed here. And then at two seconds, when it's halfway down the ramp, it reaches the frictionless side, and it starts to speed up again. So in the negative x direction. So it's slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, then speeds up again. From the velocity point of view, we know we have an initial velocity of 2 meters per second. Um, oh, sorry, negative 2 meters per second. I did that wrong. 
because we're moving to the left. So our initial velocity is negative two meters per second. And our acceleration is 0.75. So we know acceleration and velocity are related by acceleration is the slope of the velocity. So A equals delta V over delta T, rise over run. So if my slope, my acceleration is 0.75 between this point and this point, we know that I have a constant slope oops, of 0.75. Um, instead of trying to graph that out, the other thing I know that I already solved for is that at two seconds, my velocity is a quarter, or my speed is a quarter of that, which it originally was. So it's 0.5 at two seconds. And so I, since I know I have a constant slope, I can just connect those two. And that's what I get. Um, and you could see, you can measure this slope if you wanted. The rise over run here, this would be delta V. This is delta T. Delta V over delta T would in, indeed equal 0.75 meters per second squared. Um, OK, so then finally, from two seconds until the end of the ramp, now we have this new acceleration, which is FGX um, over M, whatever it's, it's due to the force of gravity. Again, I didn't solve for that number, but I know that it is a negative acceleration. And I think we'll find that the that value is, well, we have to find this. The value is, well, yeah, I don't know. But it, it's probably going to be faster. Um, but anyway, the, the slope will get something where it speeds up again. It is in the negative x direction, but it gets it slows down, slows down, then it gets faster again. So this is, even though it's going negative, this is v getting further and further away from zero until it reaches the bottom of the ramp, in which case we don't know what's going to happen. But if we assume it's just a flat, frictionless surface, then we know there would be no forces on it at that point. And so the velocity would be constant, and acceleration would be zero. The last thing we could do is actually solve for what the time is here. So what at what time does the box reach the bottom of the ramp? And for that, we just need the kinematics equation again. We would take the one that has x in it as well. We have x equals x naught plus v naught t plus a t squared. But uh, apparently, you're not going to really need to do that. But you would end up just solving for t. Um, OK, that's, um, that's this whole question. Um, are there so other questions? There was one person that had their hand raised. Um, Vianney, Vianney? Uh, yeah. Um, could you go over practice final three questions, question five? Yeah. Practice final three, question five. And I will, tr at the end, at least spend a couple minutes going through the last request that I got, which was on um, some Bernoulli multiple choice, I think. Um, if that person's still here, you can remind me at the end. OK, I'm um, sorry, which question again on this one? Uh, five, problem five. five. Sure. Um, OK. Oh, this one. I remember this one. Um, this is a tough one. Um, all right, this is a whole can of worms to open before, like right at the end, but let me see, let me at least set it up. Um, so we have like basically a yo-yo type of deal where a disc is connected on the outside by a, a, a rope that's like wrapped around it here and it is released so it can unwind um, as it falls without slipping. Um, so we can assume the rope is massless and thin and applies a constant tension as it unwinds they give us the moment of inertia of the disc, and our pivot is the center of the disc. And the question is, what is the tension force from this string? And then the really key thing is that without slipping implies that a point on the edge of the rotating disc um, and the disc's center of mass move at the same speed, but in opposite directions. So let's unpack what that means. Um, so the, yeah, so here's the center of mass and let's just pick a point on the outside of the disc. So the, they're moving at the same speed, but in opposite 
direction. So here's a point on the rotating disc. And as it's falling, this point is going to be moving this way. Um, and then the center of mass, I guess, would have to be moving. But that doesn't make sense. Um, oh, OK. So yeah, I guess I, I see what they're saying there. Yeah. So. Let me let me pick a different point that'll maybe be clearer. So here's the center of mass. Let's pick the point that's connected right here. So as the as the disk slips, the center of mass will be going down, right? The the disk is falling. That goes down, and they're saying that this piece of the disk it's rotating, so that has to be going up. We know just like the way things rotate that the tangential velocity of the disk here is up. And we know that the speed, that v, we'll just call it v, is actually the same, even though one's down and one's up. So uh, now let's go ahead and actually try to solve for the, the tension force here. Um, so we can do, it's not static equilibrium here, but we do have a relationship between um, the force dumped in via gravity and the force dumped in via tension. So from the, the force perspective, uh, we have that, well, yeah, I don't know. So let, let, let's do let's do torques first, actually. So the center of mass is here. And so gravity acts on the center of the disk, right? Gravity is pulling down here, Fg. Gravity does not have a, does not cause a torque because the distance between where the force acts and the center of mass is, Zero, or not just the center of mass, but the pivot point. It tells us the pivot is the center of the disk, so there's no torque. The only torque that we have is due to this tension force, which acts here, F tension. So the sum of the torques, the total amount of torque, is just equal to the torque due to tension, which is equal to the force due to tension times the R perpendicular. And our perpendicular here, the distance between the tension force and the center of mass is just the radius of the disk, which is just R. So the torque is just the force due to tension, so Ft times the radius of the disk. Um, and then from the force perspective, our sum of our forces, now we have both the force due to tension and the force due to gravity. We only have to worry about the y direction, right? There's only up and down forces here. So here we have force due to tension is up, and force due to gravity is down, and it's just minus mg. But it's not equal to zero, and no, oh sorry, not equal to zero, and neither is the tension force. And this is the key to solving the problem: is that these are both not equal to zero, but we know how to relate them due to this hint here, without slipping, the fact that the speed that the center of mass is moving down is the same speed that the edge of the disk is moving up. So let's start with the center of mass moving down part. Let's see, what should this actual, actually equal? Well, it equals F equals MA, so it's mass times whatever the acceleration is in the y direction. And then the acceleration can actually come from our change in velocity, right? So m a delta t, or sorry, m a y is equal to m delta v y over delta t. So this is kind of weird because it's like, what interval are we actually looking at? But I'm just going to leave it vague right now. It's just between some interval, the acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time. And that's that's just true. Right, so if we want, we can just assume our initial is zero. So we know delta V equals V final minus V initial. If we take V initial to equal zero, in other words, let's start our interval when we first let go of the rotating disk, then V initial is zero and we just get delta V equals V final and then delta T, which is equal to T final minus T initial. T initial is zero, we'll just say that's when we start. So it's just a single T. So we can really just say this is m v over t. OK, now let's do the same thing. It's going to be a little trickier for the torques. 
because now we have to do this in terms of angular velocity. So we know that the torque that we introduce gives us the uh, I, well, okay. F equals MA, torque is equal to I times delta omega over delta T. We also call that alpha. I don't know what, what's given on your equation sheet, but in the same way that it's mass times chain, like slope of velocity, it's moment of inertia times slope of angular velocity. So here, the last trick, and sorry, I'm really rushing at this point because we're running out of time, but the key here is relating this omega to velocity, right? And we know that the velocity on the edge of the wheel is equal to the velocity in the center. But anyway, how omega relates to velocity is that it's just equal to V over R. So omega equals V over R. And you can see the, the units work out. Omega is in inverse seconds. V is meters per second divided by meters. So this is equal to delta V over R delta T. Um, OK, and so we can use the same trick here. We're just assuming we're starting at 0. This turns into V over R T. And so sorry, this has really become a mess. But what I've been able to do now is extract two equations, F tension times R equals V over RT, and then also F tension minus MG equals V, sorry, M V over T. And sorry, I forgot an I over here. I forgot my moment of inertia. Um, now I have two equations that have V and FT, so I can use them to solve for V and cancel it out. And all I, like my only unknown will end up being F tension. Um, so yeah, the, the last thing I need to do is plug in the expression they give us for moment of inertia in here. And then like, for instance, I could use this equation, solve for V, which equals something then plug it in here. And now I will have an equation that has only FT, FT and all the other things that I know. Um, so I'll be able to solve for the tension force. So sorry I had to rush that, but the key, the key things in this problem were, I mean, there's a lot, I don't know, I, I, it's hard to boil down. There's a lot of tricks here. One is just determining what this hint actually really means. Um, another is, you know, using this, torques and forces that are not balanced, but you in this with the same complexity that we normally reserve for balanced torques. Um, should we expect something this difficult on the final? It's hard to say. That's a very personal question. I would say no. This problem is um, more, I say more physics-y in that it's like, uh, this, yeah, I don't know. This, this is, this problem has too many tricks in it. I think this problem has like three different tricks in it. And generally on a on an exam lately, and I've worked with Armella before, there's there's definitely tricks. They're not easy exams, but there's like maybe one, maybe two tricks in a problem. Not this many. Um, this is a little more abstract. So yeah, it, it's possible, but my best guess is is that this this type of thing would not be on there, especially because the the kinematics part. If she's not having you do serious kinematics, this this gets a little tough. Um, but yeah, that's just my that's my guess. Um, lastly, there was someone else, and sorry, you'll have to speak up again because I've forgotten it and lost it in the chat. Who wanted to see a another multiple choice question? I will head over to that real quickly and try to speed through it. If you still are here, um, is that person still here? Um, okay, they're not, but I'll answer this last question in the chat here. Um, tips for what to focus on about capacitor problems. One, I would say practicing using the loop rule to get the sign right. Um, I know I argued kind of that the sign's not important, but it's not important in that the answer, you can kind of write your answer however you want, but you do need to be specific. So I guess it's important to understand, but once you do, the you can make it work anyway. Anyway, the takeaway from that is 
practice charging and discharging a capacitor and specifically draw your loop rule, draw the positive terminal of the positive side of the capacitor, draw the negative side, and make sure you can see why the voltage drop should be positive or negative. Um, when the positive and negative plate of the capacitor impacts, I mean, it really does just impact the signs, but if it's discharging, it will determine the direction of the current. Um, so that's that's important. Current flow is positive to negative, right? So if you uh, if you hook a capacitor up into a circuit, current is going to flow out of the positive terminal into the negative. Um, but uh, you will not get an answer key for FNT17. Um, there are some TAs. I mean, you can always email us, but for specific answers. But some TAs review sessions are devoted to going over FNT17, I believe. Um, so you can look for those. Um, one more tip for capacitor problems are do a problem in full, like look at the answers, whatever you need to do, but then ask yourself, just make up more questions about it. What if it was, what if I needed the charge instead? How would that change? Or if the, the problem doesn't ask you about discharging, extend it. Say maybe how long would it take for the charge to get to pick some arbitrary, like one fifth of the original value, and then you can solve and it'll just get more, you get you more practice working with these equations. Um, the max voltage of a capacitor, if it's charged with a battery, um, then it will always charge up to the voltage of the battery. Uh, but like, let's say I had a capacitor that was charged up to two volts and I put it in a circuit with a one volt battery, the capacitor will, not, will actually overpower the battery. It will discharge and get down to one volt and that's where it will stop. But if you have a capacitor that you put in a circuit with a battery, it will always end up, if you let it come to equilibrium, at the same voltage of the battery. There can be circuits with a capacitor and multiple batteries. Um, that's pretty tough. I mean, maybe like the most simple case is you just have two batteries stacked next to each other, in which case they just act like one bigger battery. Um, I don't think you'll get it something much more complex than that. It's, it's hard to speak about that generally, though. Um, okay, I'm going to have to wrap it up there. Um, thank you everyone for your questions and for your participation. I'm happy with how much we got through and I will, uh, yeah, wish you the best of luck on the final and yeah, to my former students, great seeing your names flash up on the screen again. <laughs> All right. Bye everyone.